So I'll be talking about imaging technique. Um, this provides multi-scale imaging from organelles all the way to human organ levels. First of all, white optical imaging. Um, over the entire EM spectrum, which covers at least 20 orders of magnitude in terms of photon energy or wavelength, light occupies this tiny region, but this is the only region that provides molecular specificity. Uh, because from the physics perspective, we know that light matter interaction occurs at the molecular level. Given the fundamental roles of molecules in biomedicine, we really have to work on this problem despite all the challenges we face. By detecting molecules, we can provide a number of imaging capabilities, including in vivo functional imaging, very much similar to functional or both MRI, in vivo metabolic imaging, similar to PET, in vivo molecular imaging of gene expressions or disease markers, even in vivo label free histologic imaging. And so you can see this uh, very powerful list of capabilities, but we face daunting challenges. The main challenge is light scattering. The mean free path is roughly 100 microns between scattering events. So light will basically evolve into a diffusion problem in terms of propagation. And that pre prevents us from getting very high resolution in terms of uh, deep imaging. If you look at the history of optical imaging, um, the standard, the, the first generation optical imaging, planar optical microscopy, could not penetrate beyond one mean free path, namely the aberration limit, which is only 100 microns in tissue. Coherence-based modern techniques, such as two-photon microscopy, allows us to break that limit and provide 10 times deeper penetration, up to about a millimeter in scattered biological tissue. This limit is called optical diffusion limit. Using photoacoustic tomography, we overcome this limit and enhance the penetration by nearly two orders of magnitude. Now we're talking about not just multiple millimeters, but even multiple centimeters of penetration in scattering biological tissue. We face the next challenge. In fact, we're developing the next generation technique to provide even deeper penetration. But today I'll focus on photoacoustic tomography, which is mat mature enough for a lot of practical applications. In photoacoustic tomography, we first uh, use a nanosecond laser pulse, we expand the laser beam such as the energy per area or the radiant exposure is within the safety limit. We allow photons to scatter around or to diffuse deeply into biological tissue to excite acoustic waves. Every milli-degree of temperature rise gives you roughly 800, 800 pascals of pressure, which is detectable already with a reasonably good SNR. In fact, you can heat up hundreds of milli-degrees and you're still within the safety limit and you get a very good SNR to work with. Unlike standard optical imaging, which detects um, light diffusion or diffuse photons coming out of a tissue, we, de we detect the, the photoacoustic wave, or the acoustic uh, signal coming out of the tissue. The key difference is that the acoustic scattering coefficient is orders of magnitude weaker or lower uh, than the optical scattering coefficient. And so tissue to ultrasound is very much like um, water to light. So you can see through water really well using light, and ultrasound can see through tissue really, really well. But standard pulse ultrasound imaging will not give you molecular contrast. And so we're combining optical contrast, which gives you molecular specificity with ultrasonic resolution for very deep tissue imaging. And that's the essence of our technique. You do have to run immerse problems to form image, very similar to X-ray CT. Here we deal with a inverse spherical radon transform, except we deal with extra dimension because this is a inverse transformized spherical shell and it's a curved surface. So it's a bit more complex than the standard X-ray CT. In 2003, we published the first functional photoacoustic images, also the first in vivo images. Uh, in small animals, we can see brain activation by wiggling one side of the whiskers, the contralateral side of the brain, it was hemodynamically activated. And so those images were non-invasively acquired. Since the publication of this paper in 2003, our field has grown exponentially. And you, after uh, 2010, the conference on photoacoustics has become the largest at uh, Photonics West, which has 20,000 at attendees every year. Last year, uh, our field has published 1,000 peer-reviewed papers. Um, in fact, it has uh, 28,000 citations uh, within one year. So this has become a huge field. In fact, um, at least 18 companies, to my knowledge, um, are commercializing photoacoustic tomography. And the underlying companies are, are um, 
associated with my technology. So I do have equity. I have to disclose this as required. And there are also companies working with us. They prefer to be, uh, to be anonymous and for various reasons. So why is this technology so exciting? This is probably the only omniscale imaging capability that allows you to uh, provide in vivo imaging uh, from organelles all the way to whole body smile models or human organs with a consistent contrast because we're imaging light absorption, light absorption as the contrast mechanism and so you can provide molecular imaging. This type of imaging capability uh, can play a number of roles and can find potentially many applications. For example, omniscale biological research from organelles all the way to organisms, translation of microscopic lab discoveries to macroscopic clinical practice. So I'm plotting the image in depth versus the spatial resolution. And you can see this dashed line, uh, which connects all the different implementations. And you can scale, depending on the application, you pick a depth, and then we can scan the system, design the system accordingly to, be to best match uh, the, the preferred resolution and depth. And so each horizontal bar represents one of the implementations. You, you, there are many more implementations than I can plot here. And I'll go through some of them just to give you a flavor about the capability of the technology. For the O3 work, we used a single element transducer which required us to rotate around animal, which took about 20 minutes. Obviously, that's too slow. So finally, we built a single impulse version that gives us a snapshot image of a cross section. This is good for uh, trunk imaging of a small animal. Um, so you start from the laser, roll the beam to a conical lens to generate a hollow cone beam, and that's the best way to use every bit of laser energy you have. You focus the beam to the trunk of the animal, you generate a photoacoustic wave, then we use a full ring ultrasound transducer to view the animal from all possible angles. This gives you the best image quality. We use 512 elements. This meets the Nyquist, the spatial Nyquist criterion, as we know from the engineering design principle, that's always a key to get the best images. To um, image deep into tissue, uh, because the signal can become weaker and weaker exponentially toward the middle of the, of the animal, you want to pre-amplify the signal before the cable noise creeps in. We have a one-to-one -one mapping for data acquisition. So a single laser shot will give you an image. All the data is acquired within the acoustic transit time, which translates into about tens of microseconds. That's how fast we can get an image. So you don't have to worry about any motion artifact. Of course, the computer will do the image reconstruction and presentation. Here's a close-up. You have this hollow cone beam for focusing. We have an ultrasonic uh, focusing for elevational resolution but the lateral resolution comes from the inverse spherical readout transformation. And the system can be used for um, brain imaging as well. So here we uh, use a diffuser to generate a solid as opposed to a solid cone beam, uh, as opposed to a hollow cone beam. And the rest of the system is uh, very much the same as trunk imaging. Just to give you an example, so we're imaging the trunk of this animal. The red line shows the current cross-section being imaged. Um, we fire the laser at 50 hertz pulse repetition rate. That means we have a 50 hertz frame rate. But you can fire up to like even kilohertz. Your system can respond to that. So this is an extremely fast technology. And you can see, we can, without injecting any contrast agents, we can see various organs like the kidney. You, can, um, you probably just saw the symmetry between the two kidneys. And mainly we're targeting hemoglobin absorption, but you can vary your wavelengths. You can target different, different absorbers as well. We can even see some of the lung structures, and that's a close-up currently showing the liver uh, of the organ. So obviously you can scale up the system for human-level imaging. Uh, this is a human breast imaging system. Uh, you can see this aperture with a 22 centimeters diameter. This black ring is the ultrasound transducer. Again, we have 512 elements for parallel detection. This system operates around this point. It gives you multiple centimeters penetration, hundreds of microns resolution. This is an example um, imaged from a, a healthy human volunteer. Um, you can see this is the nipple region. We use color to code depth. Each image, a 2D image, was acquired within 150 microseconds. The acoustic transit time across the field of view. This is a bigger field of view than the small animal. 
the entire 3D image was acquired within a single breath hole to minimize any breathing-induced artifact. And so within 15 seconds, we can acquire an entire 3D image. The smallest vessel diameter is a quarter of a millimeter. And this is actually finer resolution than MRI. And we provide four centimeter penetration, and which, is, which actually encompasses more than 95% of all breasts after slight deformation against the chest wall, which is painless. And you can see a few cross sections. So let me scale to the microscopic world using our technique. This photograph shows the first 3D photocopy microscope, which was built by our lab. And this is a close-up of the key component. We generate a, a donut beam uh, focused into the tissue. And so the core was made dark to minimize surface interference. With a single laser shot, we can generate a 1D image. The ultrasound detection is confocal with light illumination to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio. And so we can raster scan this head in a water tray to get a 3D image. You have a membrane window here to couple light and sound. The tissue is placed, placed below the membrane window. So this is the operates around here. I just moved from here to here. Uh, gives you about three millimeter penetration, but tens of microns resolution. So you're scaling depth and resolution. This is an example image of our own palm. Again, you don't have to inject any contrast agent. We're using hemoglobin as an endogenous contrast. And you can get a depth resolved image showing the, the standard skin structures. We can scale further for optical resolution imaging. Um, Within one millimeter penetration, this is where you can still focus light. So light is not totally diffuse yet. And this is an example. Uh, within a second, we can get a very detailed image of brain vessels in a small animal. And we can actually image the function. So this color uh, codes oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. And this is fast enough because the entire 3D image was acquired within a second. So you can image fast enough to see real-time response. We do electric high power stimulation uh, to see the hemoglobin response. We can scale down even further for finer resolution by using nonlinearity. So now we're talking about organelle level type of imaging. And now the penetration is about 100 microns. So this is not, very for, not for very deep penetration. So this is a, a standard diffraction limited resolution image. Uh, we can see mitochondria, but we don't resolve the internal structure. But if you use nonlinear photoacoustics, we can push the resolution to 90 nanometers, which allows us to resolve some of the internal structures within mitochondria. And here's a comparison between the two. And that's an EM micrograph for comparison. So I just overviewed the general capability of our system, but you can think of many applications. So I'll just give you a few examples here so you get an idea about the different applications we can provide. And this is resident state functional connectivity in a mouse brain. Um, so we can provide very fast imaging, and then you can uh, analyze the data. Even in resting state, the two hemispheres are connected. Uh, you can uh, test based on the hemoglobin uh, signal variations. And so the circle means the seat. You can see the two sides are correlated. And more recently, this is still unpublished, we tried to push the temporal resolution to the limit of our technique. And this, is, this was done in a small animal. We look at two types of signals. SO2 means the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. And HBT is the total hemoglobin concentration. Both signals will, will give you a response. But oxygen saturation gives you a much faster response. You can see this wave comes in much faster than the second wave, than the lower wave. And so let's analyze uh, the signals in more detail. We're plotting the fractional change versus time. And this is probably the only um, single impulse response. By impulse, I mean that the pulse duration must be faster, much, must, must be shorter than the response time. Otherwise, you don't, you don't call that an imp impulse. And so this is a real-time impulse response. And if we plot the oxygen saturation, which is the blue curve here, versus the uh, the total hemoglobin concentration. And so you can see the impulse is only 40 milliseconds long. And you can see the response at a three sigma drop at around 130 milliseconds. But if you look at the total hemoglobin uh, concentration, it comes at a much later time. It's about three times as long. In fact, both MRI 
works around here. So potentially, if we can get this to work, um, we can image the signal much, much faster. And this is, of course, done in small animals. The big question is, can we translate, this, translate the same type of imaging into humans? Now, to push oxygen saturation to the ultimate limit, which is a single red blood cell limit, and we implemented a, a very fast microscopic technique. So this is a system working at 1 hertz, 20 hertz. In reality, we work at 200 hertz. That allows us to get this real-time image in a small animal. You can see single red blood cells. You can see how they bifurcate. Now, we can also monitor the color of each red blood cell. And that allows us to quantify the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. And this was done in humans. And you can see in our own finger cuticle how red blood cells change color when they release oxygen. And you can single out one of the, uh, if I can come back and replay this, it's not playing. There's some latency here. It doesn't play this movie again. But, well, maybe I should skip. It's not playing again. Anyway, we singled out one of the red blood cells that shows you how color varies. Now you can also uh, using you can also use the ex vivo uh, technique to get very fine resolution of all sorts of other contrasts. And so far, I've mainly demonstrated hemoglobin contrast, but you can uh, target different absorbers inside a tissue. And so this is an example where we can even see cell nuclei. So this is very much like H staining, but we don't stain at all. We're using endogenous DNA and RNA absorption as the contrast to see cell nuclei. In fact, we can provide histology equivalent images. Now here, this was done ex vivo, so that means you can um, cut off the top layer and look at a deeper layer at a very high resolution. And so this simultaneously provides a hemoglobin contrast that you can see blood vessels quite well and lipid contrast, and this is a combination of multiple contrasts. You can see here, uh, axons will show up in our images as well. And we can also use other type of contrast, exogenous contrast, um, to, to enrich our contrast mechanisms. And so first of all, let me show you an image that's an analogous to uh, bold MRI that gives you uh, functional contrast. We're looking at hemoglobin again, and so you can see one-sided stimulation or activation. But we can do something that's very much similar to PET. And so you can look at glucose uptake. And we're using optical uh, glucose analog to give us the contrast. And so you can see one-sided glucose uptake due to stimulation. And so you can see the power of this technique. Not only do we provide multi-scale imaging, but we can also connect with MRI. We can connect with PET. We can even probably connect with uh, ultrasound imaging. So this is very much like a, a common stream that allows you to connect all the different techniques to provide a comprehensive, comprehensive study of the problem um, you're, you're researching on. So um, we can also use genetic encoding uh, to image all sorts of proteins. And this is an example where we have reversibly switchable proteins. So you can turn the absorption on and off using light. And it, when the protein absorption is on, we can see the protein signal plus the background. And we can switch off the absorption of the protein. And that only shows the background in our image. And of course, visually, sometimes you can't even tell the difference between the two. But if you subtract them, and you can show the protein signal, because that's the only thing that has changed. And the background is removed. And so that gives you all sorts of mechanisms to do uh, many uh, different studies. And that's genetically specific. We, you might have heard of GCAMP. So that's a protein that's used to uh, detect a calcium signal, which is serves as, as a surrogate to voltage signal. And everybody's after the voltage signal, but it's harder to detect. And so this has been um, really transformed neuroscience studies in small animals. In fact, photoacoustics can detect GCAMP as well. And so we tested it in uh, fruit flies to begin with. And you can see the activation due to the GCAMP signal. And this is a plot. You know, when the odor is on, the stimulation is on, you can see a huge spike uh, due to the G-CAMP absorption. So how do we translate this into um, animals? In fact, our hardware is ready for whole brain imaging in a small animal. So the G-CAMP works at the wrong wavelength. And so at that wavelength, the light doesn't really penetrate very well. And so we have to find a near IR version of G-CAMP. And our hardware is waiting for that kind of near IR counterpart of G-CAMP 
And then we can see uh, through the entire brain of a small animal. In fact, this is the only optical Im imaging modality that allows us to see through the entire um, animal brain, a mouse brain or a rat brain, uh, which is 11 millimeters deep, which is 10 times deeper than what two photon microscopy can provide in terms of penetration. And so we, we can't wait until um, the uh, G-CAMP indicator or becomes available in the near IR region, or a voltage indicator uh, for that matter, which we, would be even better. And so um, just to show that how deep we can uh, image, I already demonstrated that you know, a healthy volunteer, we can image four centimeters into a human organ. And so in fact, we're using that for breast cancer detection. This is an example where um, X-ray mammography actually missed the tumor, but ultrasound picked up the tumor, and we have this dot right here. That's a piece of metal outside of the tumor region, and just to get, give you a landmark. Our technique can uh, see, of course, this is the nipple region for reference. You can see the tumor quite well, as shown right here. This is a blood vessel density map. Um, at the same time, we can image elastography. Uh, so we're providing elastography to image uh, the stiffness of this tumor. You can see this tumor region is stiffer uh, than the surrounding normal tissue. And so the big question is, can we translate this into human brain imaging? Right? This is a very challenging problem, right? It was considered by a lot of people uh, as impossible. And but we're pushing this direction anyway, because ultrasound at the right frequency can actually go through the full thickness of the skull. Um, you have to make sure the frequency is uh, below one megahertz, typically around 0.75 megahertz. That gives us a pretty good penetration because the ultrasound attenuation coefficient scales with the frequency. The higher frequency components will attenuate a lot faster than the lower frequency ones. But even at that kind of frequency, you, you, you may get about a millimeter uh, resolution after de aberration. So this is a very interesting direction. We know that light can go through the brain. You know, in fact, there's diffuse optical imaging, and that's demonstrated you can image round trip. The light has to go into the brain and comes out of the brain, and you can see brain response using light, light alone. Of course, the spatial resolution is quite poor. So our hope is that we use the photoacoustics to provide the molecular type of contrast, but provides you much higher spatial resolution. And so here's um, our effort uh, so far. So this is an MRI image of this uh, in vivo uh, human volunteer. And this is the MRI image of the brain cortex. And we got this type of image. Very exciting at the time. Of course, the scalp image uh, was, scalp signal was much stronger than the cortical signal. And so at that time, it, we couldn't differentiate the two signals. We know we're getting some signal, uh, maybe from the cortex, but we couldn't really tease that out. And so this is, very recent demonstration, and that actually shows that for the first time we can see the cortical signal. And you can see that at the right angle, you can see that part of the region is in the cortical layer that's uh, be below the skull. And so we're very excited to get this data, and we're looking forward to um, get even sharper images. And right now, you, in fact, you can see some of the vessels that shows up quite well. And now we're testing the functional version as well. We're also very excited that uh, companies have licensed RP. They're commercializing our technique for both human imaging and small animal imaging. Uh, so this is the website if you're interested in more details. And this is a, a breast image they've uh, acquired recently and they're doing in vivo imaging. Let me use, a, um, let me use one slide um, to touch upon another technique we're developing in the lab. Uh, we built the fastest camera in the world. Uh, we know that you know, I talked about the scattering challenge of uh, optical imaging. Another big challenge is that light travels too fast. And so as we know that nothing travels faster than, the, than light. And so to capture light propagation requires a light speed camera and there was nothing there. And if you want to capture light speed propagation at, uh, in real time, you have to really enhance your speed by orders of magnitude from what's available. And so we uh, build this camera that allows us to image at 100 billion frames per second. And so the movies here have been slowed down by 10 billion times uh, in order for us to watch. And so the movie somehow only plays one round. It's supposed to recycle. Let me see if I can go back and uh, just replay. Still doesn't play. So you can, you, you can see this light propagation, right, um, which gets reflected. 
Do we know from the back end whether we can replay the movies? Somehow it only allows me to play one round. So I came back, use forward, doesn't play. Should I escape and uh, do I have the full control here or is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I just escape and replay the movie, let's see how that goes. All right, you can see that, all right. This is a light pulse. It's a single shot. We don't repeat the light pulse because some other movies may show something similar, but they actually repeat the laser pulse many, many times. For each laser pulse, they capture one frame. And so here we have one laser shot. We capture all the frames in real time. Yeah, you can see a light refraction, and the two light pulses are having a race here in two different materials. And this is single shot fluorescence lifetime imaging at two different colors. So we change our camera to a color version. And you can see excitation pulse, which is green, and red is uh, fluorescence decay. The fluorescence only happens within uh, nanoseconds, but we have picoseconds type of resolution. So that feels like eternity. You can think of many applications. You might have heard of FLIMP, fluorescence lifetime imaging. And so we are doing a single shot FLIMP. This is real-time imaging. In fact, one of the neural-related projects we we're doing now is try to study within a neural network how action potential propagates across the entire neural network in real time. And we have to slow down our camera to do that work. And you can think of many other applications as well. Finally, um, for more information, please visit our website, um, which has a lot of other related information. Uh, we have two books that gives you a lot more details about what we do. Um, you know, I'm definitely very grateful for Caltech, which has built us a, a dream lab. Um, you can see this is one of the fours of our lab. Uh, we organize the lab by uh, multi-scale imaging. Um, in the proximal end, we have nanoscopic imaging. At the very far end, we have macroscopic. In fact, we're doing human imaging at the very far end. Um, so we have openings for uh, graduate students and postdocs. Let me know if you're interested. Uh, we've been funded mainly by NIH, but we have some funding from NASA and uh, NSF. Thank you very much. Questions, Ricky. Really excellent talk, thank, thank you. you. I'm very interested in your um, through skull brain imaging. And I was wondering, you said that uh, you're operating the acoustic wave at less than a megahertz. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about how the skull affects the specs of your image? So uh, SNR resolution. Right, so at, um, at about uh, one megahertz, um, you get roughly 20 dB attenuation. So you have about a factor of 10 attenuation. And so you, I think you were talking about two megahertz. I would imagine that would be uh, probably 40 dB. Exactly. Right, so that would be about 100 <laughs> times attenuation. Um, so that's for one way. You know, if it was a round trip, you would, you know, square that again. So that would, uh, so, you know, we can tolerate about 10 times. Um, you had, you know, light will attenuate a few times to about up to 10 times as well. So round trip is probably about 100 times attenuation for us as well. So um, you do have to um, keep every bit of SNR, which is why we implement preamplifiers. Uh, very different from uh, standard pulse echo ultrasound imaging, uh, where they have a lot of signals. They don't have to worry about, you know, preamplify the signal. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, we can we can get um, as sufficient SNR to see the brain cortex. Yeah. Thank you. Very exciting talk. Thank you. Um, I noticed in your talk you mentioned the sensing the uh, glucose analog which is uh, um, uh, MBDG. Yeah. What's the challenge of sensing glucose per se? Thank you. The glucose absorption uh, sits in the mid-IR region uh, where water presents a big background. You know, so the background is really the, the key challenge. You know, so um, you know, water signal is not just the DC, not static. It fluctuates as well. So the problem is how do you, you know, tease out the glucose change versus the background change? Yeah, so, um, you know, dry glucose would be really easy for us to image, for example. And also at um, the mid-IR wavelength, the light penetration is actually very, very shallow. And so uh, for a deep penetration, you probably want to not use, not use mid-IR directly, but you may want to use some overtones. 
and to, to move to a, a near, the near IR region for deeper penetration. And that's an um, unsolved problem. You know, a lot of people actually um, targeted this problem using light only or even using photoacoustics. In fact, uh, over a decade ago, uh, an Israeli company called Glucon um, you know, hired me as an advisor to target this problem. Um, they demonstrated some uh, fantastic sensitivity. And the big question is, uh, can we get specificity as well? Yeah. Uh, in fact, that's what typical what people typically do. Uh, they use the spectral information to separate different absorbers. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Rao. Outstanding presentation. Um, I'm a clinician myself, and this work I think can transform the whole medicine field, the way we practice medicine. So I was wondering to what extent clinical trials or some human studies, the safety of some of these imaging techniques that are done in animals are ongoing in various areas. Right. Um, so um, there, are, you know, labs have done uh, clinical studies already. Um, companies are actually pushing this through FDA. Um, you know, in fact, it has been clear uh, in Europe already uh, for human use. Um, you know, there, around the world, I listed about you know 18 companies. Actually, there are far more. I mean, some giant companies actually prefer to be anonymous, <laughs> so, uh, and they're actually working on the same problem. So I expect uh, this is going to come very soon. Um, the companies I, I work with are also going through um, the, the agencies as well for approval, and so they're very active clinical research. Uh, breast imaging is one of the main focus uh, foci right now, um, but there are others you can imagine. Uh, the GI tract, we can miniaturize the probe for endoscopic application. Uh, and we're also, also doing a clinical study uh, for transvaginal imaging uh, for the cervix as well. And there are many, so thank you. I have a question. So sure. uh, you, sh you saw some amazing functional uh, and structural imaging. On the functional side, um, so you used, um, I guess, hemoglobin and oxygen saturation. Um, could you get to other modalities too that, that may be a faster means for probing neural activity, voltage or, yeah, or um, calcium? Or, yeah. So the voltage signal per se, um, the big question is, uh, is there any um, optical signal um, that get, that's provided intrinsically without any contrast agents? Uh, people are studying that. You know, there might be something, right? So there's even um, elastic information you know, so the MR folks have um, discovered quite recently. Um, so, in fact, we should be able to detect that as well. And I showed that um, breast elastography, and that was acquired using photoacoustics. We can see the strain change. Usually, the type of signals like that are quite small. And so, you may ha actually have to have some sort of, you know, averaging or locking mechanism uh, to pick up the signal. But um, you can also use voltage indicators. You know, so those are dyes or maybe proteins, you know, but that's still being studied. Um, it's uh, not very easy to get uh, an indicator that works at the right wavelength. But we're working with actually multiple groups um, uh, in that direction as well. So those are you know, contrast agents or indicator groups where we provide the hardware uh, to pick up the signals. And so that would be a very exciting direction. So the, the G-CAMP um, I mentioned um, is the calcium surrogate to the voltage indicator. And they, are, they tend to be slower, and, but their responses tend to be bigger as well. So, and you know, there are challenges ahead, obviously, but uh, the prospects are extremely exciting. So. Very fascinating work. Let's thank, thank you. Leon again. Thank you. <laughs>